Uh, I'm just going to be, I'm going to do a fairly, just a fairly general big picture. Uh, obviously, the, the big political shifts that have already happened and the potential for two or three other political shifts in Europe, it, it, in my mind, that's pretty much driving the market. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be sticking with pretty high level macro here and not, not getting too hung up on details, uh, partially because I think there's still uh, quite a bit of uncertainty about how things are going to play out. Um, I think we probably have the least predictable uh, president that the U.S. has ever had, and that does complicate things when it comes to trying to make any kind of meaningful prediction about what's going to happen. Uh, one thing that I do note, and it's noted in the talk here, that's worth keeping in mind is that the markets right now are actually showing, to my mind, surprisingly little volatility. Um, risk measures, by and large, are, are at very low levels, and simply based on predict, you know, based on the potential for unpredictability. I mean, I'm not even talking about bad outcomes per se; just simply difficult to predict outcomes. I'm surprised how low all those risk measures are, um, and I think that you know it behooves us to keep in mind that the markets are trading right now like everything's bound to go perfectly. Uh, and that's almost never what ends up happening when the market assumes everything's going to go perfectly. Things tend not to go perfectly. So you do want to uh, you want to keep your eye on the ball this year, I think, because there's potential for for rapid shifts based on, you know, frankly, a crazy tweet or something. I mean, who knows what the hell it's going to be? But you you got to keep in mind there's a the potential for that kind of exogenous risk is actually quite a bit higher than it used to be. This is essentially, and you know, in a very big picture sense, this is the shifts. You know, some of these shifts, and I'm, I'm, what I'm laying out here is shifting perceptions. In other words, this is what I view as the market thinking the shifts are going to happen. I don't necessarily agree that all these shifts are going to happen myself, or agree that they're going to happen to the extent the market thinks. But this is what I think the market is trading on right now. Uh, there's a widespread assumption that we're going to shift from seven years of monetary stimulus which essentially is money printing low interest rates. It's not that the stimulus is going to disappear, but we will see a shift from predominantly monetary stimulus, at least in the U.S., and potentially in, in China and a couple of other areas, predominantly monetary stimulus to predominantly fiscal stimulus, which is to say either government spending and or uh, large tax cuts. The two things are essentially the same at a fiscal level, but it does, you know, you. Generally speaking, historically, fiscal stimulus tends to have uh, a better track record of short-term action in, ter in terms of actually pushing growth. It's still unknown exactly how much of that there's going to be. I mean, the guy just got inaugurated yesterday, so you know, there's, there's a lot of internal politics even within his own party that are going to determine what he's actually able to do. Uh, but based on what he's talking about, he's talking about much more fiscal stimulus. Uh, the Fed is talking about much less monetary stimulus, but I think there's actually a fight brewing there that's one of the things I think is going to make this year interesting. Uh, I think there was a widespread belief in the market for several years, uh, l largely based on actual readings that we were in a, if not a deflationary, then a potentially deflationary environment. There's evidence across most of the economic blocks that we're, we're finally starting to come out of that now not just in the U.S., but also in Europe. You've seen inflation measures, and especially at the PPI level, at the producer price index level, you've seen most, uh, eco most inflation readings turn up in the last six months, uh, basically pretty much everywhere, really, not just in the U.S. Uh, it remains to be seen how much movement there, there's going to be on those, but that does change the landscape a bit, and it's also one of the reasons why I'm a little bit less concerned about uh, gold and other metals slash commodities and then some people might be because even a relatively small move in these measures on the upward side uh, increases the odds that we're going to have a continued negative real rate environment and that's really the best long-term historical um, guidepost to whether you're going to have good or not so good metals and commodities market is whether you've got negative real rates historically that's one of the most reliable indicators uh, and I think we'll largely because we are seeing some upward movement in the inflation measures and because I don't expect most central banks to get ahead of it I don't see us sh yet shifting out of that negative rate environment and the other thing um, you know we're in a very low but we're still in a very low volatility environment um, risk like I mentioned the risk are, are extremely low 
Um, the market doesn't expect those to increase. I, I personally expect them to increase. I just, I just think that the basic uh, volatility measures, the basic risk measures right now, I think, are simply understating the amount of unpredictability. And it's not just Trump. I mean, there's several elections in Europe this year. There's Brexit. There's a whole bunch of things that could create some big shifts. And the market simply isn't accounting for any of that stuff. It's just, it's just waiting to see what happens. So I think if you, you know, it's wise to keep in mind that there's, there's definitely room for some big um, negative consequences that the market simply isn't pricing in at all. Um, basically, Trump, if he, if he gets his way, if he, what, he, what he wants to do, he's talking big infrastructure, relatively big infrastructure spending. It's actually not that big if you look at infrastructure programs in China. It's pretty tiny, actually, but by U.S. standards, it's a big program, trillion dollars plus. That's been driving a lot of the trading in the last little while. There's also an expectation he's going to do a significant tax cut. Uh, that, I think, he, he wants to do. It looks to me like the GOP is behind him, so I'm assuming you... Americans do get a tax cut this year in some way, shape, or form. He's also talking about repatriating overseas uh, money held by U.S. corporations. Uh, there seems to be an assumption, on his part at least, that by doing that you're going to see a lot more uh, business investment, and a lot more factories getting built, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, historically, that's not what happened when the U.S. has done that. Uh, George Bush, the younger, actually they had a very similar program about 12 years ago. Uh, there was a short-term sort of tax holiday where he allowed those companies to repatriate the money. And basically, they did with it what they've done with it for the last 20 years, which was share buybacks and dividends and, uh, and basically increases for the executive salaries. Uh, my cynical expectation is we'll see the same thing again. So I'm not personally assuming that's going to drive any more investment. But the infrastructure, uh, such as it is, may drive some and certainly it's driving the trading and that's you know as people that are trading in this stuff and investing in this stuff sometimes it's not a matter of deciding uh, whether the market's right or wrong you're a lot of the time you're just trying to decide which way the market's going to go and try to get ahead of it even if the market's completely insane it doesn't matter as long as you're on the right side of it and you get out before they figure it out I mean, this is what we've seen for the last two months here. I mean, if you look on the, the chart on the left, of course, is the S&P. You see the big leg up post-Trump. That's essentially the re reflation trade. Everything's awesome. We're going to see these big growth rate increases. And, you know, I talked about the shift in inflation. You can see that in the chart on the right side. That's the five-year tips break even. And that's, that's basically traders' expectations of inflation five years going forward. That's what drives the trading in it. So it's used by a lot of analysts as a, as a gauge of the market's expectations of inflation. You can see it was moving already. It didn't just move because of Trump. Part of the reason why it moved was that uh, oil prices started rising earlier this year and then rose more once there was an OPEC deal. And energy prices do drive a lot of the inflation expectations. But you do definitely see a leg up there towards the end of the year. You've seen another leg up just recently, like literally in the last few sessions. Um, and if you look at, if you go and take a look at similar measures for Britain, for the Eurozone, for China, all of those areas you're seeing this, you're seeing this same move. There's a fairly widespread belief that we're going to see higher inflation. And I'm not talking crazy hyperinflation or anything. I'm talking about going from like nothing, essentially 1% to 2 or 3, which in the which in the case of what we've come out of in the last seven years is still significant. Um, it will still have impacts on the market. You know, personally, I'm not, uh, I'm not yet completely sold on the idea that uh, we're going to see this big leg up in growth. It's just it's simply too early to tell. What we're seeing so far is a big leg, is big leg up in expectations. And quite often, you know, people act on their expectations, so it may well be that we do, in fact, see a fairly significant move up in growth in the U.S. that helps drive... Uh, a move up in growth in other areas because you have also seen expectations getting much more positive across the Eurozone and, and in China, even in Japan, which has been flat forever. Uh, that may drive it. The expectations may actually generate the growth. The one thing that's holding me back from being a complete believer in this is one thing I'd like to see in the U.S., for instance, and I'm still not seeing it, is, uh, and this is something I've harped on for years, you've got to see you know, the U.S. is a, a consumer economy. Seventy percent of that economy is based on consumer spending at one level or another. 
in order to generate three or four percent real growth rates, you've got to generate three or four percent real wage increases. People have to get paid more money to, to be able to buy stuff. In the short term, if there's a strong enough upward move in uh, enthusiasm, animal spirits, yes, people will go out and buy stuff on credit on the assumption that things are going to get better and their wages are going to increase. But that's a fairly temporary thing. In order to generate the growth rates they're talking about, we've got to see those wage increases, and we haven't seen them yet. That's going to be the one, one of the biggest things I'm watching for, and not the, overall, not the overall amount of employment income, but I'm looking for non-supervisory because that's the vast majority of people in the economy are non-supervisory workers. And that's one metric I watch very closely in the U.S. You know, are we actually starting to see those wages increase? There's a bit of evidence, there's some wage pressure, but let's see four or five months of, you know, three or four percent wage increases, and then I'd be a much bigger believer that we're actually going to pull off this three or four percent growth. I don't think we do it without those. So that's probably more than anything else what I'm watching. Uh, to my mind, the market's a little bit ahead of reality right now. So I'm a little bit cautious on it. I think it's one of the reasons why you've seen the S&P basically go sideways for a month. Uh, now that we've had the inauguration, I think we've moved past expectations and we're going to have to see how much, basically how much patience does the market have with a new administration. Now that they're actually in power, people are going to expect to start seeing policy, uh, expect, the, expect the GOP to be telling them what they're going to do and, and see them actually passing legislation. So. I think, I think if they don't see some action relatively soon, uh, I think at best we get a sideways market until, uh, until people actually see these policies get enacted. I, I don't think the honeymoon lasts a lot longer, so I'm being a little bit careful in the major markets because of that. Uh, and I think that one paradigm I think we're going to see through this year, uh, you know, keep in mind Trump is at, at heart the guy's a protectionist. Uh, you know, good, bad, or indifferent, whatever you think of that, that's his, that's his worldview. Uh, he doesn't want to see, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't personally want to see the dollar higher. He's been trying to trash talk it two or three times in the last week. Uh, on the other hand, you've got the Fed looking at these measures of, of a tightening economy. They're talking about two or three rate increases this year. I, I think there's a fairly high probability that you're going to see some, some real fights between the White House and the Fed this year. Uh, who wins those fights? I have no idea. Um, Strictly speaking, the Fed is supposed to be independent and apolitical, and they're not supposed to care whether the guy or the woman in the White House is ticked off by what they do. Uh, whether that's the way it's going to play out in reality, I'm, I'm far less convinced. Uh, they, get, they succumb to pressure like everybody. So one of, the, one of the things that's going to matter a lot for the gold market in particular is does the Fed actually tighten as quickly as everybody assumed. And I would point out that the, to me the situation is very similar to what it was a year ago. Uh, you know, a year ago everybody and their dog was along the U.S. dollar. Everybody and their dog was expecting four rate increases because that's basically what the Fed was telegraphing in late 2015. We ended up getting one. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to, we're going to get it's going to go that easy this year, but I'm still a bit skeptical about three or four. Uh, you know, we'll see how things play out, but uh, I do think there's going to be a lot of pressure from the White House not to increase rates. Uh, I don't think they want to see the dollar stronger. Uh, and the, the other thing that's going to be, uh, will have a big impact on the dollar, and again, it's unpredictable, is how much trade tension do we get? I mean, you know, Trump's been talking, you know, pretty tough talk, pretty tough language about a lot of his trading partners. What is he going to do in practice now that he's in power? I mean, my sense is he's, my sense is he's going to do stuff. I mean, I think he's pretty serious about trying to, uh, you know, impose tariffs or executive orders or do something to, to, uh, to try to really put a lock on some of the trading partners. Uh, I don't think that's a great idea, and that's another reason why I'm skeptical about three or four percent growth, because there's nothing like a hard protectionist to basically put the brakes on an economy. So I, I, I think the dangers there are pretty significant, but I, like everyone, I just don't know what the guy's going to do, and I'm not going to try too hard to second guess it. Uh, these two things here, these are just uh, PMIs and expectation numbers for China and Europe, and the reason I throw those up is I'm just pointing out that things have actually been improving there a lot. It's it tended to be ignored and from what I've seen in the financial press, but things have actually been improving quite a bit in both of those areas. And again, this feeds back to the you know, the U.S. dollar in general, 
a year ago, a little more than a year ago, everybody was expecting this big divergence between the U.S. and the rest of the world when it came to growth. We're back to that paradigm again where everybody expects this big divergence between the U.S. and the rest of the world. I'm, you know, we didn't see it happen last year. I'm not yet sold that we're going to see it this year. So that's why, you know, the basis, the basis of what I'm looking at is my expectations are still that we don't see this surge everybody talks about the U.S. dollar index going to 110 or 120. I think you'd choke the U.S. economy right off if that happens. If it happens, it'll be short term. I think I don't think the divergence is, is just not going to be as big as people think. And the trade is so one-sided right now in the U.S. dollar that I'm, I'm expecting it to, you've seen it pull back a little bit recently, and I, I think it probably levels off here. And I think the combination of that plus acceptance that there is, in fact, more and more uncertainty and unpredictability going forward, I'm actually reasonably comfortable about the gold price. I don't expect gold to have a bad year. I'm not sure it's going to have a fantastic year, but I'm not really looking for that. I'm just looking for gold to be you know, stable or work its way back up and to say the mid to high 1200s, I think that's pretty high probability right now. And that's more than enough to underpin, you know, the, the trading that we do. Uh, you know, if it goes to 1500, 1600, that's a bonus. I'm not really looking for that. I'm just, I'm just looking for it to be strong enough that people decide it's going to be the right side of the trade to be on. And my expectation is also that because I, I'm expecting sort of a fairly flat market, in the general markets, well, well, the market kind of reprices itself to this new paradigm. I think odds are fairly good that the the commodity space, the gold space in particular, the gold miner space, I think it'll probably won't be one of the best sectors in the market this year. Uh, it, it's probably going to be one of the places to be. Uh, the fact that all the, everybody institutional bailed on it at the end of the year is generally a pretty good sign because those guys tend to have terrible timing. Uh, the fact that they all left at the end of 2016 bodes actually actually bodes pretty well for this year. I think it will be one of the best, maybe the best performing sector. Uh, as far as the rest of the metals go, uh, you know, the improved sentiment has definitely helped everything. Uh, I think it's also simply helped everything that we've got to the end of a very large, very long, very ugly commodity bear market. We've finally seen enough movement in terms of supply being choked off either because mines aren't getting built, mines are coming to the end of their useful life, or large, large companies in the different base metal space and, and uranium and a few other things, they're, they're simply scaling back growth plans. They've all been doing that for a couple of years now. So I'm not seeing as much danger of oversupply as I did before. It varies depending on the base metal. I mean, to put it in very short form, I suppose, uh, I think, uh, Probably of the base metals, this is probably not, this is no secret to subscribers. I think zinc probably has the best looking, uh, best looking future, one to three, you know, one to three years out. Uh, there are no large mines coming on. There's two coming in 2018 that will more or less replace one of the larger ones that came offline a couple of years ago. Both of those large mines actually have challenges. They both got some metallurgical issues. I think I think they'll get dealt with. But neither of them is easy, and neither of them, I, I don't think either of them is going to be particularly cheap when it comes to production. There's not a hell of a lot else in the pipeline. Uh, I think the expectation of everybody in the space was that zinc would have another one of these shorter short spikes like, like it had in the mid-2000s. I think it's going to have a spike, but I'm not sure it's going to be that short this time. I, I, think, I think it's quite possible you see zinc prices between 150 and 2 bucks for two or three years, because I just don't see where the supply comes from to, uh, to mitigate that. Copper looks better than I actually thought it would. It, like it did a lot better in 2016 than I expected it to. Uh, I would note, though, a lot of that buying was speculative. There was a lot of spec buying in the copper market out of China. I don't know how much of that is unwound. Some of it has, but my well, I think the copper market will be okay, and I can certainly live with 250, 260. Uh, I, I wouldn't call myself a copper bull. I'm not expecting it to have a really big run unless I see some more supply come off. Uh, which I haven't seen yet. I, there is, you know, you have seen a lot of the big guys scaling back their growth plans, so you're not seeing new copper production come on as fast as it was expected to. But I don't see the I don't see the big supply demand imbalance like you do in the zinc market. I think copper will do okay, but I'm not expecting great things from it. I'm expecting it to be all right. Uh, the last one that I'll go into because I'm already using my time is uranium. Is a thing. <laughs> it's become a thing in the last month. 
I got to be honest with you, I'm, I'm skeptical about this. Uh, I can understand why it's happening at a market sentiment level. Uh, uranium just got so ugly, and it was ugly, ugly, ugly down to 18 bucks. It's had a bounce back up to 22. Everyone's going batshit crazy in the market. I've seen, you know, half of the juniors have doubled or tripled. There's, I've, I've seen a lot of articles from a lot of friends in the business that are suddenly talking about, you know, $40 uranium by the end of 2017. I have no idea who would do the buying to drive the uranium price to that level. Um, it's not going to be the guys that use it. I don't see any evidence whatsoever of any immediacy on the part of buyers, and by that I mean utilities, other end users for uranium. There's a lot of above ground stocks in uranium. Uh, people, have, people forget that you know, when everything went offline in Germany, when everything went offline in, in Japan, especially Japan, uh, being, the, you know, being the upstanding types that they are, the Japanese didn't break their supply contracts. They kept buying this stuff, even though their reactors were shut off. You know, they promised to take delivery, they took delivery, they paid for it. There's a lot of inventories like that that are floating around right now. All of the other utilities know it, so I find it very difficult to understand why someone on that side of the uranium market would feel compelled to buy uranium up to 30 or 40 dollars. And uh, I haven't seen, I haven't seen the long-term price, I haven't seen the contract price moving. And if you are actually going to see this big move in uranium, you should see that first. You're going to see the actual buyers, the long-term contract guys coming into the market, signing long-term agreements to buy, to lock in supply for themselves. Right now they're not doing that. They're actually buying most of these utilities right now that don't have, that have any immediate needs are buying in the spot market. And that's, to me, that's a sign that they're not worried about supply, not that they are. That's them saying, you know, why should I sign a long-term contract five or six bucks a pound above current spot when I can get all I want in the spot market? So, you know, as nice as that run's been, and it might have farther to go, uh, if you're riding that run, you know, make sure you take money off the table regularly because I'm, as much as I'd love to see the uranium price go to 30 or 40 bucks, I'm, I'm not a believer yet. So for me, it's, it's going to be mainly gold, silver, um, zinc, definitely, copper. Copper is always good, a good copper deposit that work, if it works, it works. Uh, uranium and energy, I'm, I'm still pretty skeptical on both of those. Um, I've already run over time, so I'm going to stop there.